Congress and Judge Jim Holden. And don't expect more than about 2,000 PSI pencils, right? But for toys and uh, little tools and stuff, it's really cool. Um, right. Dave and I build stuff. I've always built stuff. And I used to have to go to the hardware store and buy chunks of aluminum and pieces of plastic and, and make a big mess with saws and drills and and I discovered about in uh, uh, 2012, I uh, discovered 3D printing. And uh, these makers just opened up and pushed the loop about one. And a little cable drive printer. And he's running three of them on the shelf from a Mac Mini. And uh, I walked in and gave my credit card and said, I got to have one of those. And that's what got it started. Uh, so it's 3D printing isn't just the uh, hot mount glue gun meets 3D motion table thing. There's more facets to it. There's stuff like the uh, laser cut paper and glue stacking paper. That's, uh, and they actually um, print on them now so you get color, which is kind of cool. Uh, but for actually industrial use or parts you can actually use, um, the latest thing is uh, selective sintering, either of plastic beads, which are not much bigger than the printer filament, or printer uh, uh, toner, like for laser printers. It's a little bigger pieces than that, but not by much. So you can have super high resolution, depending on how big your laser is. Uh, and now they're doing metal, too. So there's, there's the type of metal you can probably do at home would be bronze. Um, it's pre-coated with the solder. Those little bronze balls are normal, but really microscopic. Uh, makes a really interesting part. These pictures are just some of the things I've done. This is an art object for uh, <laughs> burning an art car, and that's a tool, but that's the kind of range of those. I don't do a lot of art cars, only by request. Uh, so, the additive <coughs>
uh, most of what I do is toys and tools. One cool thing is project boxes. You got project boxes, you need to get a project, you need to go to the box, you want a custom box, you gotta have holes. Print the holes in front of the box, you don't have to drill that. Put the parts in it and hold it together. Um, here's uh, some common websites I use. DigiKey is everything electrical, electronic, plus and plus good stuff. Mechanical cars, all mechanical stuff. I get all my nuts, bolts, and screws from there. Mare Hacker for printer parts and filament. Oshpark for inserter boards. Thingiverse uh, has a lot of, uh, I would say mostly STL files, but if you actually look for uh, open SCAD files, then you can pull in the library, you can modify it and make your own thing. There are a lot of libraries, like the um, Invaluable Gear libraries. Um, there's, there's lots of stuff on it. Most of it's artsy, but there's a lot of good mechanical things too. Um, Countcap uh, is a place that has some uh, computer electronics for printers. And my latest uh, printer. They make a, uh, it's a cape for Beagle Bump Black, which is a whole lot more capable computer, which is on Linux, and have your 3D printer, and uh, actually running the Octoprint software on the printer, which is kind of cool. So they have a, a standalone Linux platform that is a 3D printer. Okay. So I got one. I'm going to get that going this weekend, I hope. So it prevents the water from sticking onto the... It doesn't form a vacuum in the bottom of the cup. One of those little things. You have a printer, so you can make all kinds of stuff. And I stole a bunch of them from that because I like to have ice water. And so I also have the same problem with me. I have water compensation for the more like a tranquil seal on the bottom, and then every time I lift it up, the people can apply the scattered water over my head. Lots of little problems. I want precision and 
the reason it's the size it is is because that's as big as I can pick out the thing with fits in the front seat of the car. And it's solid enough that even if I bang it against the door frame, it doesn't get out of line and pass it over. So you don't need to calibrate it very often? Um, only when someone grabs it and turns one of the Z screws, then I have to recalibrate it. But yeah, it's a one time thing. It's just parapeting the, the X parallel to Y. And it's just, it's, I take a, a, a table all the way forward, you got the direct vertical between the X uh, rails and the Y rails. So you just put a parallel between them and bring it down so it's the same gap on both sides. But once it's in position, it doesn't drift out. You have to actually turn it in the hand. Oh. So Dave was explaining about the smoothie wear. This is what happens sometimes. Yeah. It, it just cramps and it's telling the layers just like start like... I call this like a TARDIS that went through a tiny wiping accident. And it just looks like uh, part of it just shifted or translated. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening with this guy. Uh, 30-bit fixed point, and it's just it's about four bit short of what it really needs. And so, um, if at certain uh, accelerations and certain angles, um, one axis can take too long, and the other axis is a faster moving one, and then it misses. I was trying to fix it, but the processor is a 32-bit processor, and it doesn't like to do 64 bit math. So, I was going to ask you about something you said about the, uh, uh, the Linux. You were going to run Linux with Octopi? Yeah. Right on the machine? Yeah. So, what, will you be able to see the graphics of the Octopi interface? It's a web server, yeah. Oh, okay. So, it's a web server. Yeah, yeah it, the Octopi is a web server, so it, it puts it out. Yeah, if you know the IP address of your of your printer, you get the full graphic remotely as well as on the printer. And, and you said you're, you're disappointed with smoothing where what are you going to use instead when you use Octa Printer? You know, the Redeem from, from Thing Printer. Redeem. Okay, that's your pleasure. Yes, the... Or Redeem. Yeah. I don't know why they call it that. That's kind of weird. But, uh, that's a, that's a gigahertz 32-bit uh, A8 with four coprocessors. It's got a graphics coprocessor, a floating point coprocessor, and two 32-bit RISC processors. So, and it's, it's built, it's a TI processor built on G tools. So it's, it's actually doing what's intended to be doing. But it's, it's a, I mean, if you want to run graphics, use the use of Pi 3, but um, if you're doing machine control, the, Black, black part better choice. <clears throat> what have you made, uh, I mean, fixed or made better using the computer? Fixed or made better? Mm -hmm. um, okay. At Train Club, it had a little bracket that holds uh, a connector under the layout so you can adjust the height of the connector for the, the light stanchion for traffic signals street lights, train signals, so on. You should drill out and then solder uh, a uh, shaft collar to a piece of brass that had holes drilled in. Okay, so they got sharp edges. It won't, it doesn't retain the screws. Um, and it's a pain, it takes a 100 watt soldering iron to put it together. A real pain, uh, maybe about 50 of them. And that was actually my first ever 3D uh, printing project, and I printed about 100 of them uh, on the book of about one, and they worked wonderfully. They held the screws, the, the connector slid through nice and smooth, um, just solved the problem completely. And yeah, they took, it took longer to make, but it's a robot doing it, <laughs> getting away from the room. I've got two printers and I keep them running a lot. They're they're printing for something every day. A couple of printers each. Okay. Um, so I don't 
use it in the living room at home if you're doing APS, it's really stinky. Um, uh, PLA is fine though. Uh, watch it for the first two layers, because sometimes even if the first layer goes down, uh, this, it might come and look unstuck. Look at its corners. And if you have corners, use a brim. Um, just because it stays stuck there. If it comes up, start peeling out the third or fourth layer, you'll end up with a real mess. You might even hit, might even hit the uh, grin as it goes by and knock it completely loose. But usually, if it gets the second layer down and everything is still stuck, um, it's not finished the whole part without without wood. Most, most problems happen while we're in the first or second layer, usually the first layer. Um, some advice you gave me uh, a month or so ago really helped me out when you gave me some advice about how printing speed versus temperature. Uh, oh, yeah. That, that yeah. Really made all the difference in the world. Right. Yep. That's, that's kind of a uh, problem in the design. The uh, Temperature control is that of the aluminum block, not the nozzle. The nozzle is brass, which is a very poor conductor. Um, so the faster you go, the lower your temperature gets. So if you can, even though the aluminum block is staying rock solid at 220, um, the tip of that nozzle may drop down to 180. And it's just it precipitous drop at that high speed. Um, so. Some, some PLAs won't stay stuck at 180, so you'll have you'll, you'll pop apart in layers. Uh, that's it's like, well, wait a minute, how can it come apart in layers? I printed it at 120 degrees. Well, when you were printing at 100 millimeters a second, it just can't heat that fast. So, heat sink compound helps considerably, but uh, the nozzle really should be copper, but copper is a real pain in the ass machine. Uh, and it wouldn't last as long. Some new ones are stainless steel, which is about the same conductivity as brass. Um, but they really should be copper, even though that's not really easy to make. I have, I have made one of my own out of copper. It lasted for about two rolls of material, and it worked great. But it, would, it took an hour and four number 79 drills to, you know, I just bought the brass one. And it goes a little bit slower. 30 or 40 millimeters a second, the temperature is pretty close. It's, it only drops 7 to 10 degrees, and that's not, a, not an issue. Let's see, this is where we are. Um, the outer perimeter is at 30, pretty everything else is at 40. So it's not real fast. That's one of the disadvantages of a, of a screw driven machine, is my top speed is only 100 millimeters a second, and because of the uh, glitches in the software and Print quality issues. About 40 is my normal print speed, about 40 dollars a second. Um, I can do it until since I have 60, but I can do it all. Text-based, reducing 
trying to tell what's on the screen looks like what's in your head. Um, there's Blender. There's you can sketch up and down. Anything that will generate an STL file can be used it to, for 3D. If you got the box, you can, you can do uh, SOLIDWORKS. That's a real good job.
make it stop somewhere not on the front end. Yeah. The front head doesn't melt down your front wall. Because that's what always happens to me when I Yeah, it, it's, it's in the pause regime. You, normally, they'll, they'll, they'll move the X all the way over to the stop. And just sit there and wait for it. Yeah. Where do you see the balance coming between doing uh, prototypes? They'll never do production. It's too slow. They'll do ones, tens, maybe hundreds, but not millions. Never, it'll never happen. It's too slow. Um, you mentioned Blender earlier. Um, you're working in Blender as a mostly a poly workflow, or yeah, how do you export? Never use it, but it does export SDLs once you have an object. Okay. It's 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 hard to get it manifold. Which meaning no little interior cavities, which will mess up an STL file. It needs to be a single service. That's one of the hard parts about doing 3D printing is to understand that your object has to have a single service. All I mean, you have internal stuff, but you have to have a hole to get there. So, what would you like somebody that's starting out with modeling? What, what's your reason why you like OpenSCAD as far as it's better for making true parametric service. Yeah, I use OpenSCAD exclusively. Uh, I've taken stuff that was on Thingiverse, done in Blender, and loaded it, chopped off a piece, reshaped, made minor, minor modifications. But I don't usually work in Blender because I don't like the, I like the precision of typing numbers. And Blender doesn't really lend itself to that. It wants to be more art for you. I only use it about two hours, so I can't really so speak. So you, you'll take a poly from a poly that's watertight and bring it into OpenSCAD and then? You can import an STL file into OpenSCAD and slice it in half and add bolt holes and, or ch chop off a piece or reorient it however you want. Yeah, I've done that. Or make something that doesn't look printable. printable. It's like, okay, if I take the Cut it off here, print the bottom half, bottom part, then cut this here, turn that that way and that that way, hey, go print. And then glue the, if you bring in the ABS, and the nice thing is you can solve it, weld it all together. No screws, but when I use PLA, so I have a screw library, so I love 440 screws. <laughs> Pick them out of the library, put a screw hole here, and, uh, and just bolt it back together. Uh, I guess I'm having a hard time visualizing why well, you can't have a void. It's a mathematical problem. Uh, SCL file defines the surface. It wants to be one surface, no holes. Now, there's always going to be some holes just to, due to because it's floating point numbers and there are precision issues. But most of them will take one or two least significant bits and just say, oh, uh, those are supposed to be the same point. And those just make them the same point. And I'm going to have to fix it for you. But if you actually have, like, the, the common thing in, in OpenSCAD is to have two planes that are parallel at the same coordinate, and for whatever reason, they don't end up being the same plane. They end up being, well, they're touching here, and they're touching there, and there's a little gap here, and it won't, it won't slice. So what you have to do, I have an overlap value. I usually use 0.05 nanometers. And I just, I just deliberately overlap the two parts by 0.05 millimeters, pop it open. It forces it to be manageable. You can't have any little gaps and voids due to floating point errors. The float is the only uh, number format that OpenSCAD has. So I have to do something float. On your 440 screw bolts, are you actually printing threads? or? No, I don't print threads. Not, not for 440. Uh, quarter 20, yeah. Print threads. I've got, uh, but I got some examples of threads. This is uh, 20 threads per inch, and this is 24 threads per inch. But, and it's threads on and on. It's really strong. Right. But you're limited. I've done uh, quarter 28. I've tried 832. Now 1024 though works. Um, the bit. If you print 0.1 millimeter layers of vertical with the thread vertical or scroll ball. Um, and 
until you, you until you get to about around 15, 18 frames per inch. Um, 3816 printed horizontally is usable if you run down to the first. It takes out a little bit of a jerk, not much.
research on my last name, which I'll write over here. Um, here the Hackaday, the research on Hackaday Pride, and my last name will come again. And they're one of the semi finalists in the system tech, which is a box you can click on that to find it. But um, the Google group is linked there, and if you want to just take a look at it, it's an open Google group. So now there's a big long list of things that the teachers are visually impaired on. Most of them are pretty simple. Some of them are a little subtle, like something, it's like, um, you know, objects of constant volume, um, joints, um, and then phospholipid bilayer. So if you want to do a phospholipid bilayer, you always want to do that, go for it. Because somebody is teaching a blind. So I will show you our, our Happy Day um, prize entry, which was a very, very simple, but it's, it's a little more subtle than, uh, than it looks. So they wanted objects of constant volume. So you remember from geometry, here's a cylinder, here's a cone. These have the same volume as each other. And so for blind kids, they'll pour water from one to the other. And I drank all my water because I was coughing. Sorry, I was coughing. But, um, so I can't do the little demo here. But, um, but basically, you have to make column objects, all the same volume. And then the kids pour in water. So we said, how hard can this be? So we made them. They came out pretty nice. And then we shipped off the STLs to the, um, the first of my teacher. And they came back and said, um, no. Um, no, the kids took these and they're stabbing themselves with it. Because <laughs> they're so, well, they're blind, right? So they said, oh, so now they have a, a nice little thing on top. So all, everything we do is also an open SCAT. Uh, one of the things that, that wasn't mentioned is uh, there's a new, new-ish um, CAD program called OnShape. And it's some of the people who <coughs> have done uh, SolidWorks, except OnShape has a free version.
So the one that I found, this is the story that I'm going to tell, is um, this chapter that uh, started out uh, last uh, August. And um, let me see if I can find the presentation. Last August in Valencia, it was started as a high school club by a girl named Valerie Nagrimi. She is a musician. And um, and uh, this is like the first high school-led community chapter of Enable. And so uh, her story starts sometime last year when she started up a 3D um, club at her high school. And you can see it's in Design, Develop, Donate. She was very altruistic in her intentions. And so she started up the club. They got some like money. They were able to buy a printer. And she discovered, as Joan has pointed out, that you buy the printer, and then you discover that it's not as easy to use the printer as you would think. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and so what she did is, um, because the, the printer was belonged to the school at that point, and she could only work on it during school hours, she decided, I think, that the only way that she was really going to learn 3D printing is if she did it at home. And so with the support of her parents, she actually got a 3D printer at home that she could use to um, to uh, work on things. Now the way that the Enable program works, as far as I know, is that you kind of show your commitment or your ability to contribute to the program by um, printing like um, a hand and showing that you can print it, that you can assemble it, and then sending it to them. And from that, they can tell that you're serious and that you're able to do it. And so that's exactly what she did. She assembled a couple of hands and then uh, she filled out the form so that she could become a community chapter. And then they got her through the process, they did a little Google Hangout, and then they, they basically set her up. They have like a, um, like a little like guide on how to set up a community chapter, and they started off with a 3D printer and then lost the filament, and, and, um, and you know, get the recipe, make a Facebook page, give them a way to donate to you. And then they link to it from that enabled the future site that I showed, so anyone who was interested they click on the map and they say, I want someone in Southern California, and then she's pretty much the only one. And so the reason that she wanted to participate in this is because she's a musician, and she really wants to target other musicians who, for whatever reason, um, you know, they're missing a hand, and, and having a prosthetic would really help them um, be able to enjoy music again. So you can see that... Um, on wrong, she started August 20th of this year. So this is a very, very new chapter. And she's already had like a lot of inquiries to her Facebook page. Um, she's had like a lot of good feedback. And the reason that she was very passionate about this is because she is a musician. I think she's a, a pianist. And it's something that she's very passionate about. And if she suffered an injury, and you know, for a while she was worried that that was the end of her ability to play the piano, but luckily she recovered. But from that experience, she realized how fortunate she was and she really wanted to help others. And so right now, um, uh, the school year has started, she has a new advisor. Um, she's trying to design a prosthetic hand that you know will be able to hold a guitar pick. And she's got like a couple of people who get fired about you know, wanting a prosthetic hand and she's trying to um, accommodate them. And you know, she's a senior at Valencia High School, um, has a lot of honors, is very into piano, has a lot of activities, and eventually wants to kind of um, have a doctorate in music and medicine. So after she gave me this PowerPoint, I said, this is really good, but I want to know like how I can help you. Like, What are some of the challenges that you have faced? So she gave me this list. She said that some of her problems or challenges were learning how to make new models. Like she's getting like volunteers who want to help her out, but she's like the leader and she has to guide them. So just getting new models. She's like a busy high school student. There's so much that she has to do already. And on top of that, she's having to learn how to make models, how to design this prosthetic hand. Um, there's also the uh, trying to manage the, the recipients and the volunteers. People who volunteer to do the 3D printing and the, and, the, um, and the assembly and people who want it. The way that Enable has worked and the reason that they're so successful is because they really use social media. They really like to promote the story. They like to get the story out there. But you have people who don't want to be in the 
the line, like they don't want to, you know, no, they just want this to be a private transaction. So that's something that she has to, like, have, you know, that she has had to deal with. Um, finding people who are expert at 3D printing to maybe, like, help her out when she gets stuck. Even something as simple as you have all these people who want to donate money to you, but you are not a nonprofit, so you cannot receive that money. Something as basic as that. She tried to do it through her school, but it was a no-go. So even though she has like a lot of people writing to her and they want to support you, she has difficulty accept accepting the uh, support because you know she can't take the money. And then the next thing that she's concerned about is access to 3D printers. Right now she has a 3D printer that was bought with the grant money at the school. She can only use it during school hours and her advisor is there. And then she has a 3D printer she has at home. Uh, right now she's focused on kids' hands, but in the future she said if she wanted to do adult hands, then she's going to have to look into getting access to a 3D printer with a larger print net. So these are some of the challenges that she's faced, but I really think that she's very admirable. And so it's the only chapter here, I just really want to help her in any way I can. So I'm doing that by sharing the story with you today. go to schools and for the most part that's middle school but it spreads into elementary and high school as well and you know I, I think what they're doing with it is there's so much of a focus on STEM education there's a lot of engineering programs starting up even at, at elementary and beyond so they're teaching kids design and then they want to be able to 3d print whatever, whatever it is that they've created in this engineering project for household use it runs a gamut from kids printing toys I mean the little emoji we printed up there, I think every single one of my kids' friends at school has a set of those at home by now. Um, but then it's a lot of the types of things that, that we heard about today. It's people building you know, their robots and their drones and they want to make accessories for stuff. People printing bookends for their, their shelves at home and cabinet handles for their kitchen and kind of you name it. It's, it's really all over the place. Thank you. By the way, is there anyone here who brought stuff for show and tell? Which means it's going to print 
waste material that will be removed later to be able to print the real part of it once it gets up to that level. And it's really nice if you can find uh, things that don't need support because of how they're designed. Like those quadcopter parts, every one of them, whoever designed that is amazing because none of those have support. They were all printed just download, no support, nothing. And they're, they're clean. Yeah. 
think um, they'll let you download stuff for free. You have to kind of like sign into the website, but they also allow you to like sell this. So if you're making models and it's a new to you, maybe you want to sell it for a little bit, and then after after a certain time, you can just offer it up for free. Um, we're giving a lot of information here. Can you pull some of this stuff from the meetup page? <coughs> Projector ones are the ones that are like a little cheaper and homemade uh, type of printer. And they might be fun. We printed a few things that came out really nice. Um, but the surface on the one we had, like you do like four or five prints and it gets ruined and you have to like redo the surface. Um, and then you have to recalibrate and whole mess it. So yeah, if you're if you're new to 3D printing, don't do resin printing. <laughs> we printed a uh, hundred pound thrust. Uh, Lux kerosene motor, just a little one. Uh, we were using the laser center, and we had a lot of trouble with, it was regeneratively cold, so the fuel flowed through the belt of the rocket motor into the combustion chamber to cool down the belt to keep it from melting. And with the laser centering, the, the little chunks of metal were getting in the fine tubes and were blocking them up. So it actually took us several tries of professional rig to get it to right. So there's some, some very interesting things. I think looking forward to 10 years, you're going to be able to do some amazing things with this. We're really, this is sort of exciting because we're sort of the, the cusp of a whole new way of looking at this. I guess we're all waiting for that Star Trek moment, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, just, I just saw it released a 15 watt blue uh, semiconductor laser. It's, uh, if someone can get with a gimbal system to actually get it, and, and it pulses at a really high frequency. So if you get a raster engine to print with it, I think we could do some, at least plastic centering. It's not enough energy to do metal centering, but we could do the selected uh, plastic bead centering. Uh, I'd, like to see, I'd like to see a printer that, that done that way. I would, I would build one if we could. I didn't have to do the software. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could try the B9 Creator software. So That's raster. So that you can like make chocolates or like ice 
disputes or like whatever. And so I was wondering if anyone had experience with that and could guide me into good like product. Yes. So that's really <laughs> don't wait. Um, so that's uh, something that we tried over the CD package space um, to disastrous results because um, we felt that it was really, really difficult um, with all of the, um, the layers that would occur on the outside that we track food particles a lot. So it was impossible to keep it food grade safe. But you can throw in a new one every time you decide to do that. Exactly. But in which case, then it's lost the company of being a whole for reuse. Of course, that day. Yeah, it was that day. We have two yeah. people who want to weigh in on this. No. <laughs> if you want to make um, bowls for food, uh, I would uh, print a positive, uh, make a silicone mold out of it, and cast the silicone. So that was actually the question I wanted to ask is, What's my source of silicone and what should I be looking for? Uh, Able Industrial sells uh, the two part silicone. Uh, Re Reynolds Advanced Materials in Burbank is, has a yeah. million types of silicone. <laughs> they, they have molding everything. Yeah. There's one class. There is one attribute. Where? Uh, at Reynolds, they sell the handle, uh, the handle molds. Uh, and then they have a little class where you can take a class and melt the milk. I think they email both of you so they can give you like these links because I, I really did think like when I was going to 3D print, if I could do nothing else, I could at least make chocolate bones. I actually had a customer this week that we 3D printed a positive of this gorilla head that he was going to give out for Halloween as chocolate. So it made the original and he was going to make the mold out of it. So. Okay. so we had moderate success by dipping the mold in like business plants. So something that seen a, a cheese print uh, that one of our friends in, in the East Coast has made a long time ago. Um, but there's also this device called, um, shoot, what is it called? Structure? There's this device that you can put, uh, that you connect your extruder motor to, and it'll, it'll activate a big syringe with a tube, and you put the tube on your printer. And then you can just squeeze out anything that you can squeeze out of a tube. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting, but I'm yeah, not crazy about 3D printing. You can just turn on and off an uh, uh, air valve. You can print with all kinds of stuff. They've tried that, I think. It, that the air has too much compression. So the other one is a, a screw that actually uh, holds the pit, I guess, the piston of your yeah. thing, so it's a little more accurate. Yeah, and for dispensing, and, uh, the air pressure to push it out the console. Sure, but you have to manually flip it, so that's not fun. There are two other devices out there. There's actually one that actually prints sugar, so you can actually print sugar cubes in the interlock or create designs like that. I'm sure you've seen that video, and also the one that prints chocolate. Yeah, so there are that's a centering, or it's kind of inkjet, right? Um, the inkjet's water on sugar. And it It's called like Chef Jet or something. Yeah, there's one that's called Chef Jet. Of course, there's this project that features prototypes that they have to put before. thing about everybody asks for chocolate is chocolate's one of the hardest like materials to melt and harden and still taste right or come out right so that's been a crazy science that somebody hasn't There's the ones that do chocolate for you the chocolate's probably not that good tasting 
so. who, who knows? But they're they're trying it. There was one that they they had it. I don't know if it was CS or one of the other ones they had. Yeah, you know, like I said, they did the sugar, they did the chocolate. They had one that made its own pizza. Supposedly that was really weird. <laughs> um, so it's they're trying it out there. And obviously, I think everyone agrees here that you know we. <clears throat> 3D printer has been around for a long time. It became more of a hobby thing a couple years back. Um, now it, they're perfecting it where most of us can use it and as New Matter has, they kind of take it and start printing 20 minutes. Um, the, the question is, uh, as Dave said, in terms of industrial printing, are, are we going to have or be able to create uh, our own small manufacturing plant have so many printers that we can actually start printing for someone who wants to build just a certain number of these things. Um, it's, I think we're still in its infancy. I think there's a lot of technology that needs to come behind it for it to get to the same level as, you know, think of our printers were ribbon printers to dot matrix printers to all of a sudden laser printers to, or to before that even pen plotters. Plotters were taking a pen, moving it around and drawing it, and we deal with similar issues that they have with 3D printers. Um, and then finally to laser printers where we are now. Uh, again, Diego had mentioned with regards to trying to look at that and pretty on <clears throat> with that way is that using a single nozzle, squishing the PLA, and having that bond is one of the reasons why 3D printing works so well, but to try to take it to the level of Printing multiple nozzles and trying to have that same bonding is going to be another issue. And since so. we're in the open source group, I guess a lot of the technology is being held back because of patents. So uh, <laughs> there's things that we could probably do today, but only one company has, uh, you know, a hold of that technology, so nobody else could really do it. Other. There's quite a few patents that happened in just yeah. 2002, 2005. Or they're going to run out soon. Yeah, eventually, but I mean, 3D printing, if anybody knows, was invented in the mid-80s. Yeah. Um, we haven't heard of it until the patents expired, what, like nine years ago? Something like that. Are there any good examples of a patent <laughs> that's like we're all waiting to expire or something? Oh, there's a problem. Well, I don't know. These companies have these special lawyers that know how to redo a patent that makes it last longer. They, they need um, to be challenged. A lot of the times, <laughs> so. the patent office will just release a patent based on, oh, here's some pretty paperwork. And they give you that number, and as long as no one challenges it and drops a, a pile of previous art in their face, um, they'll let it stand. Yeah. There, there's a company in Boston that has a real significant printer that does full time materials, and they can do Kevlar and um, <coughs> carbon fiber, and you can do a mix of different materials that yeah. rivals. like it's a really decent servo. 
and it's going to change. It's it's going to change the way this type of stuff works. But instead, we'll get rid of the steppers and we'll go full on <coughs> AC servos. And what what is the advantage of going to a servo? Uh, a lot higher resolution, a lot more torque. So yep. that that allows you to move faster and more precisely. But isn't the faster not kept up to by the printhead? Well, you still have rapid traverses and infills, and I'm, I, I'm limited to about, realistically, 60 millimeters a second. I could, with a copper nozzle and higher water heater, I can push filament at 150 millimeters a second, but I can't move that fast. So I need a, I need a controller like the Beagle Bone Black and one of these AC servos that is 4096 steps per rotation. It's real high res, and you hook that to a, a normal lead screw, and it's it's a real machine tool at that point. You can put a, a spindle on it and do engraving or light duty milling uh, in brass or, or aluminum. Um, yeah, your tabletop machine tool at that point. Yeah, for a little while, we'll try to do that. Yeah. 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 Y